Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching NDTV. Today, we will talk about the work that women do, the work for which they don't get paid for, the work that doesn't often get counted as labor. As per a United Nations report, 75% of the world's unpaid care and domestic work is done by women. The care economy refers to paid and unpaid care work, which is by itself a crucial component of any welfare state. It includes activities such as caring for children, making sure they are mentally and physically fine, caring for the elderly, the sick, etc., which is all largely seen as women's job and responsibility. Presently, India's public spending on the care economy is less than 1% of the GDP, relatively low in comparison with other nations. Now, the Federation of Indian Chambers and Commerce and Industry, ladies' organization Fiki Flow, has come up with a comprehensive roadmap for reforms to the nation's care economy. The initiative promises to generate over 11 million jobs with women poised to claim 70% of these opportunities. This is huge. But to enable this, what kind of clarity in policy do we need? What exactly is the measure of a working woman? Do we need to actively change what a working woman is in terms of language and connotation? And why is it important to invest in a growing care economy? That's what we discuss tonight. Joining me is uh, Mitali Nikore, Chief Economist and Founder of Nikore Associates and also Sanchita Mukherjee, Business Economist, uh, who's also the Managing Partner of Talk the Walk. Uh, going across to Sanchita, to you first, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, there's, of course, a certain invisibility that is attached to care work. Now, that for years has affected skills and confidence of women. Tell us why is it important for India to recognize and invest in care work? Thank you so much for having me over. And yes, this is an amazing report that Fiki Flo has come up with. And it's the need of the hour, in my opinion, because the care industry... Uh, or even the domestic help that we employ in a house largely is in the unorganized sector. It, it's known as the unpaid uh, care economy. They are not acknowledged or validated. They do not fall in the tax bracket. Uh, it's not formal. Uh, they do not have any EPF solution for them. So it's very, very important that this large sector, which is the care industry, which also includes domestic helps, care for the elderly, care for child care, care for the disabled, come as a formal sector in the economy. Uh, a lot can be done in terms of incentivizing uh, the citizenry of India uh, for tax benefits. If you uh, employ domestic workers, you know, that will bring them uh, in the bracket of uh, having tax incentives to employ such people. And what you just rightfully mentioned, if we were to compare ourselves with other nations uh, there's so much that has been done from say united kingdom singapore new zealand south korea uh united states uh, of america germany you know they have different trainings and incentive model in which they have actually looked at the care economy into bringing it in under complete formalization so that uh, a lot of women actually can participate in the labor force and come under the formal umbrella uh, of india Right. Ms. Nikore, you know, women's unpaid work, like Sanchita was also explaining, it is a vital role, you know, it plays a vital role in the economy. It's responsible for 77.5% of the nation's GDP, according to this SBI report. In other words, women are not only shouldering the you know, burden of domestic work, but they're also boosting the GDP. But in official locks, they're not working. So, in, in fact, the Fiki report, I was looking at it, and it says that investments in care economy can bridge gender gaps in the labor force participation, something that all of us have been worried about. But what kind of public and private investments are important here? So, first of all, thanks a lot for having me. As you would be aware, I am the lead author of the Fiki report, and uh, Nicole Associates has been working very long, I mean, for a very long time with Fiki as well as uh, with the Ministry of Women and Child Development. And we are also working with CII, uh, you know, to come up with the strategies for the care economy in India. So we are advising a number of, uh, you know, organizations at this point on how to formulate a strategy for mobilizing investments in the care economy. So first, I just want to cite two or three numbers from our report, which has just come out, I mean, uh, Fiki Flo and Nicole Associates together, uh, which talks about the fact that if you look at the gender gaps in the care economy, we are valuing these gender gaps and women's unpaid work at about 15 to 17% of GDP. 
and we are doing that by taking a notional value you know the amount of time that women are spending on unpaid care work on an average which is approximately 5.6 hours every day multiplying that with the minimum wage as per the periodic labor force participation data and that's how we've come up with our estimate of uh, you know women's unpaid work being 15% of gdp hmm. now what i would like to really point out is that this is even larger than the overall economic contribution of sectors like manufacturing which sit at about 13 14% of gdp you know so this is the kind of potential that the care economy represents for the overall gdp of india that if we were to bring in private sector investment if we were to bring in public private partnerships hmm. into you know services like child care into right. services like elderly care we would be able to generate millions of jobs which would then almost 70% of which would go to women right such that you know so uh, taking off from what mitali is saying what are the practical and workable solutions that we can think of to get more women in the workforce now you know the report does talk about flexible work options leave policies that are gender sensitive there are also workshops for awareness but crashes are also there but what are the large solutions that we could be thinking of yes and i think the very vital point that mitali just mentioned would be the data collection itself you know we really as an economy as a country lack the data of this particular informal sector which can be a huge employment generator throughout uh, pan india so collecting data on the care sector including the number of caregivers what are their genders their working conditions what uh, what kind of facilities can they avail in terms of are they do they come under epfo most likely not uh, the demand for caregiving services what is the demand because we also have a certain section of the population which is aging hmm. along with a yeah. certain section of the population which who are giving birth to babies hmm. right so what is the demand over there uh, right. and how do we formalize and improve this sector what can be the private public infrastructure model that can be developed you know we have actually made huge strides at, as an economy if you talk about defense manufacturing right. if you talk about tourism if you talk about uh, pil china plus one all of these options I think it's fabulous that we are now now talking about caregiving uh, industry as a formal industry recognition and bringing it under the fold of a formal sector within the industry. Mithali, you know, taking off from this aging population, and that's something I wanted to wanted you to talk about. You know, as India's TFR also is stabilizing, we feel like you know, me, like many other nations, we could also be facing the challenge for bec of becoming a country of aging population. Of course, that is after some years. But how do we prepare for the care economy and the requirements for elderly in the coming years? Thanks a lot, uh, Siddharth. I completely agree with you. Today, the elderly are about ten percent of our population. By twenty fifty, UNFPA recommend, uh, you know, projects that it'll be double. It'll be twenty percent of the population. And if we look at the experience of countries in East Asia, many of them actually did not invest in elderly care facilities. Many of them uh, did not think that you know the elderly care would become such a big challenge. And today, they are experiencing declining female labor force participation. participation rates because of the pressure of elderly care work mm. so i think what we have you know found in our consultations and what we also recommend in the report is to look at multi generational care facilities where you know you have uh, elderly persons working with child care workers and you know their mental health is also then taken care of when they are uh, you know playing with children working with children and you know at the same time they are also taken care of by these uh, you know care workers so this is one of our biggest sort of ideas that we given in both this report as well as which has been accepted by the ministry of women and child development as well which talks about the fact that you know you let's have more and more multi generational care facilities which are you know community led which are managed by community led organizations community based organizations and they give a chance for the elderly not only to feel you know right. they feel useful in a sense right. to work with children Right, Sanjita. You know, there's another thing that the report talks about, which is the dignified jobs for caregivers. You know, at construction sites, there is a Harvard report that talks about children playing in the shadow of equipment and also in pollution. You know, how important is universal child care and also this whole concept and implementation of dignified employment for caregivers? Oh, hundred percent. I'm so glad, Vasudha, that you spoke about it. Uh, I'll give you a small example. For example, South Korea. 
has actually implemented policies as a country to recognize and reward caregivers, including financial incentives and public recognition programs. I mean, that's the level they operate in. Similar with Nordic countries, Scandinavian countries, Finland, all of that, if you see, for them, this is a very, very big component of their industry. Hmm. And uh, when we are talking about uh, India growing, for example, we are all aware, real estate, you know, it's a huge employment generator. Hmm. So hand in hand, say with affordable housing, what stops us from making senior care assisted living right. a part and parcel of the real estate program? which is sweeping the country like a revolution in today's date, right. right? So we could look at assisted living, wherein the dignity of the labor automatically comes in right? with uh, these programs. Mithali, that's, that's very interesting. The report also talks about gender-neutral parental leave and you know flexible work options. Now, one would ask, how will this help unless there is change in society from within, on, you know, especially on how men see their own roles vis-a-vis -vis women's uh, roles in society? So I completely agree with you, Vasudha. And I think, Vasudha, if you've been following, I think since 2017 till today, I have spent the last almost decade arguing against the Maternity Benefit Act as it stands currently, uh, because we are seeing evidence when we talk to women and even when we talk to employers on both sides that, you know, there is a certain amount of cost that is associated with, you know, offering a six month maternity leave, which, you know, which employers are also, um, you know, they are also kind of not benefiting that much from it and neither are women. But we have to move towards a scenario where like many of the G20 countries, we start to have more and more first of all paternity leave you know right. to start with paternity leave and then move towards a situation where we say you know what maternity and paternity it doesn't matter you are a parent you could be of any gender you could be male you could be female you could be of a, another gender and you are entitled to a parental leave regardless of your gender right and also <laughs> as a couple you should be able to decide between yourselves you know the way it's done in sweden or the way it's done right. in uh, finland that how do you split that leave between yourselves and right. the best way to do that is to create role models and to actually talk about the men who are taking this gender neutral parental leave right and i think i would look to influencers i would look to you know even film stars bollywood stars across the country you know indian film industry and say why don't you talk about the fact that you took parental right. leave i mean someone like ranbir kapoor is a great example yes. he took paternity leave for three months yes you know so i mean there is a there is a section it. of women i remember when i was taking my maternity leave and they would say you know what is the need for paternity leave because husbands would sit at home and keep asking for tea and we don't want that sanchita would you like to add to this you know uh, going to influencers setting role models and you know helping women also counter this internalizing that they do that you know child care is all my responsibility 100 percent in fact i would just like to add on to the fact that look even as a country as an economy we're extremely uh, diverse uh, and quite big if one were to compare us with nordic or scandinavian countries all of that so that's a challenge what actually uh, can be done uh, by the public private investment reforms what Fiki flow is suggesting a large reform sweep right. is to break it down into more granular sections let's understand what are the maternal and paternal leaves say when it comes to very very small businesses micro businesses then small businesses then mid uh, cap businesses what are the maternal and paternal rules when it comes to mncs large businesses right. uh, what actually happens in the informal sector you know things like that so india is so diverse it's very very difficult to make a one law one shoe fits all kind of an approach when it comes to gender neutral uh, uh, paternal maternal leaves right. one has to go sector by sector and in fact has to look at a turnover of in fact a lot of these grievances happen in the very very micro uh, companies where none of these are actually followed in letter right. or spirit so one has to understand that and then make suggestions based on strata right Thank you, Sanchita. Thank you, Mitali, for joining us on this uh, discussion. The bottom line remains it's important that women's work gets counted appropriately and supported fairly because often all women work, but not all of them get paid. Moving on to some polit politics and the biggest political developments of uh, today. NDTV's election journey has uh, reached the New Delhi Lok Sabha constituency. In fact, NDTV's uh, Vedant Agarwal and my colleague has a ground report uh, from New Delhi. Let's watch that. battle 
for the heart of the national capital. The strategically important New Delhi constituency has seen stalwarts like Atal Bihari Vajpayee, Lal Krishna Advani and Ajay Markan contest from it. It is the oldest seat in New Delhi. It houses the power corridors of India. A victory in New Delhi means a key to the seat of the world's largest democracy. The throne of power, the core of our republic, the thrust of Indian democracy. This iconic boulevard has seen it all. Defining mandates, alliances rising to power, governments falling and prime ministers running the country from here, the centre of New Delhi. One of the capital's seven constituencies, New Delhi is home to over 14 lakh voters, including high-profile electors like the President, the Prime Minister, judges and senior leaders who form one of India's most educated electorates. It was in the late 1970s, when the Janta Party was on the rise, that Atal Bihari Vajpayee wrested the all-important seat from the Congress soon after the emergency. His closest confidant and India's former Deputy Prime Minister L.K. Advani contested from New Delhi soon after in 1989 during the peak of the Ram Mandir movement. From Ajay Markan in the early 2000s to Minakshi Lekhi holding the fort for the BJP in the last decade, it has been a direct contest between the BJP and the Congress until Delhi's Aam Aadmi entered the fray. Despite Kejriwal's back-to-back -back electoral victories in the state and local polls, his party has yet to dent the BJP's prospects in the Lok Sabha. This time, it's a battle between lawyers. The Congress and the Aam Aadmi Party are in alliance in Delhi, and New Delhi is being contested by the Aam Aadmi Party. From the AAP is the man who fought for the Anna Andolan in the courts, Supreme Court lawyer and a sitting MLA from New Delhi's Malviya Nagar, Somnath Bharti. The task is cut out for the party heavyweight to defend his boss in prison and broom up his party's tattered image in the run-up to the polls. This time the election has a different colour altogether. The way the election took place in 1914, this time the reasons, the purpose, the focus is entirely different. The way BJP crushed opposition, the way they took away the rights of Delhi government, the, the way they tried to demolish the democratic uh, fabric of the nation, all will be addressed in this election. So people of Delhi want accountability from central government. All these members of parliament of BJP in last 10 years, they did not say a word. When rights of people of Delhi were being snatched by central government, they did not say a word. BJP understands Ajit Pawar, whom Honorable Prime Minister himself accused of 70,000 crores loot. He is in BJP. So BJP has a new washing machine. So now he is pure. Sagan Bujbal, who was jailed and remained in jail for one year on charges of corruption, he joined BJP. Now he is pure. You know, uh, Suventi Adhikari, Himalaya Sarma, a number of people. So new washing machine in the market, BJP, which is to purify people, people do see kaun kaam karta hai, kaun naam hai, kaun kaam hai. In a radical political move, the BJP has unseated six of its seven contentious sitting MPs from Delhi. From hate speech accused Parvesh Varma and Ramesh Biduri, to the controversial MP Gautam Gambhir, the BJP's big Delhi leaders have all been dropped. From New Delhi, the BJP has fielded a fresh face. BJP veteran Sushma Swaraj's daughter, 40-year-old Bansuri Swaraj. A political debutante, Bansuri Swaraj is a lawyer like both her parents, boasting of an illustrious legal career. There is no question of legacy. 
I can tell you that the people of Delhi have unwavering faith in Modi ki guarantee. Whether it was abrogation of Article 370, whether it was construction of a grand uh, Ram temple in Ayodhya ji, whether it was bringing 33% reservation in favor of women in both Vidhan Sabha and Parliament uh, by passing of the uh, Nari Shakti Vandana Dhiniyam. These are all promises which were enunciated in our manifesto and they have been absolutely fulfilled. These are union elections yes. uh, and therefore I think the voter also, the perspective is, is broader. We're talking about women-led development of a Vixit Bharat. So of course my vision resonates with his. The fact that most of the sitting BJP MPs were uh, removed, uh, how do you look at that? Do, do people here you see were sort of disillusioned by, uh, by the MPs of your party, uh, your predecessors? No, not at all. Not at all. हमारी पार्टी में टिकट कटते नहीं हैं, टिकट मिलते हैं, और हमारे यहाँ पद नहीं होते, दायित्व होते हैं। Delhi has nearly one and a half lakh first-time voters, and among them are thousands of young students in one of the country's biggest coaching hubs in New Delhi's Rajendra Nagar. In election season, this nerve center of UPSC aspirants is bustling with politics. अगर हम कंट्रीवाइड बात करेंगे तो इसमें नो डाउट जो प्राइम मिनिस्टर कैंडिडेट होते हैं चूंकि ये लोकसभा का इलेक्शन है उन्हीं के नाम पे वोटिंग होती है लेकिन अगर आप मेरे व्यू की बात करेंगे तो आप अपने कंस्टिट्यूएंसी और प्लस जो आपके जो भी प्रॉब्लम्स हैं रिगार्डिंग कंस्टिट्यूएंस जो भी प्रॉब्लम्स हैं उस चीज़ को भी ध्यान में रख के वोटिंग करनी चाहिए अब जैसे कि एज ए स्टूडेंट वी आर फेसिंग एन अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट पोलिटिकल लीडर हर रोज मतलब पार्टियाँ बदल रही हैं जैसे कि आप देख रहे हैं कितनी पार्टियाँ बड़ी बड़ी पार्टी के लीडर जो जैसे महाराष्ट्र में लीडर हो गए राजस्थान में लीडर हो गए मतलब ये कुछ ट्रांसपेरेंसी यार एक लीडर की कुछ अकाउंटेबिलिटी नहीं बची है वो एक इलेक्शन में इधर एक इलेक्शन में उधर आजकल जैसे कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बॉडी की जितना वो ग्रीमा गिरती जा रही है जैसे वो एक सोसाइटी का जो सोसाइटी बन रही है रिलीजन के बेसिस पे या कास्ट के बेसिस पे ये पिछले कुछ सालों में या एक दो डेकेट में बढ़ा है अभी क्योंकि अगर आज देखो आज के टाइम में अगर कोई अपनी कोई बात रखना चाहता है अगर कोई प्रोटेस्टर है या कोई और भी है अगर वो अपनी बात रखता है तो उसे एज ए एंटी नेशनल घोषित कर दिया जाता है उसी टाइप वो मेनली पार्लियामेंट में जो हो रहा है पार्लियामेंट की प्रोसीडिंग अगर हम भी देखते हैं तो पार्लियामेंट की प्रोसीडिंग में अगर उसका वो देखिए कि कितनी एफिशेंसी है वो एफिशेंसी आ ही नहीं रही है आई फील क्लीनलीनेस इज द फर्स्ट थिंग दे शुड थिंक अबाउट आई फील द स्टेट्स आर नॉट वेरी क्लीन ऑल दिस डॉग्स यर इट्स वेरी स्केरी द कॉस्ट ऑफ लिविंग इज वेरी हाई Since I'm from uh, Tamil Nadu, I see the cost of living is very high, almost double. From deadly pollution to toxic landfills and the sanitation mess, even as Delhi grapples with these long-standing issues, it is left without a chief minister. The arrest of Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal ahead of the big general elections has left the Aam Aadmi Party without its star campaigner and biggest face. The contest for the coveted New Delhi seat is a prestige battle both for the Aam Aadmi Party as well as the BJP. Many political pundits say that the BJP which has unseated six of its seven sitting MPs here in Delhi is nervous of the Aam Aadmi Party which has defeated the BJP both in state elections as well as municipal polls. But these are national elections. Can the big message of brand Modi, national security and wish for Guru trump local issues like sanitation and air pollution? That is a big question. In New Delhi with camera person Kanan Patra, Vedant, Fendi TV.